Welcome everybody to our booth for the NSF Expo 2022. We are the Nowhere Graph project. We provide area briefings within seconds for any place on earth. And I'm going to walk you through how we do this, why this is interesting, what um, you can learn from this or why you should care. And hopefully afterwards, you will also bring questions on your own or maybe you have application areas that would fit very well with what we are doing. I will also point you to some of the future presentations today and tomorrow, but um, for now, let's get started. So welcome again. Thank you very much for joining us. We are the Nowhere Graph. So what is it that we do and why we are doing it? So one of the most important challenges in data science and also data-driven decision-making more broadly is what's called the data acquisition bottleneck. The problem goes by different names in different domains. So maybe you have heard about it using a different label before, but it's always the same thing. Namely, that a majority of all the resources of a data science project, be this data discovery, data entry, data cleaning, and so forth, is what's taking up roughly 80% of all your resources in terms of money, person power, time, and so on which means that only roughly 20% of your time is left for actually deriving insights, which is of course the bummer, as you would agree with me, because those insights are then what defines the quality of your decision-making. So long story short, what we call the data wrangling, so to speak, or data massaging takes 80% of your time and money and only 20% are left. So what is it that we are trying to contribute to this problem? Well, what we do as the Nowhere Graph project is, as I introduced before, we provide these area briefings about any region on Earth really within seconds so that you can ask questions like, what is here? What happened here before? Who knows more about a certain area or an event that happened in this area? Or maybe how does this specific area or this specific event compare to maybe nearby region or distance regions or, for instance, previous events? By doing so, we hope to be able to assist data scientists and decision makers in very rapidly enhancing their situational awareness, because this situational awareness, so the understanding of the contextual information around your own knowledge, improves or defines good decision making. If I would like to put it very provocatively, I would say that our ultimate aim is to flip this 80-20 bottleneck on its head so that in the future you invest 20% of your time in data wrangling and 80% of the time in well analytics, understanding the data and making proper decisions. So I use this word situational awareness and while maybe many of you are familiar with the term, let me very briefly walk you through one way of thinking what situational awareness actually is. Situational awareness as decided, described in the literature can be divided into four phases. And then of course the last phase, which is the action, so to speak, that, that comes out of the decisions that you're taking. But you start with a perception phase. If you would like to take a decision and you need to understand your surrounding, the context of your decisions, you first need to understand what kind of data is available, what has changed, what kind of data quality do I need and stuff like this. This is the perception phase, retrieving and filtering through information. The comprehension phase is then trying to synthesize, integrate, and interpret this information to adapt it to your specific needs. So for instance, to join multiple um, different information sources together. Then you do what's called the projection phase. So you're trying to anticipate or explore and exploit current needs in respect, with respect to what has been done before, how will the situation evolve in the future, what kind of stuff can I learn from here that will apply to my future needs and stuff like this? And then of course, finally, you are ready to take your decision. The problem is, as I introduced you before too, is that roughly 80% of your time go into this greenish part here, the perception and comprehension phase. And of course, then you're squeezed on the projection and decision phase. And that's exactly what we are trying to target. <clears throat> so how are we doing this? Well, there are multiple ways how this has been done in the literature and also in industry before. And all of these are only partial solutions, but one that is very commonly used in our domain goes by the name geo-enrichment. So here, for instance, you have an interface by our partner, the world's leading JS company, Esri, and you see me having selected those red areas, those red polygons, those are fire footprints in the area of Santa Barbara. And you see that I selected one 
which is, for instance, the Thomas fire at that time, the biggest fire in the history of California. And now in time of crisis, for instance, this is the, uh, a picture of a fire just out of my window. And you would like to make, of course, decisions quickly and enrich your data quickly with, for instance, demographic data. So instead of now trying to find, clean, retrieve, integrate data about the population at risk, I can just reach out to such a geo-enrichment service in the cloud and then get streaming access, not just to relevant data about, for instance, the population at risk to be evacuated, that's the part you see on the right where the arrow is pointing to, but I get this data custom tailored, we call this apportioned to the area I selected, in this case, a specific subpart of Santa Barbara County, namely the Montecito area. So geo enrichment is fabulous, but it's not solving all problems. So let's discuss what it does well and what maybe it doesn't. So on the pro side, you get access to data on demand. This is especially important in this age of big data. You clearly don't want neither you, you nor your data science teams download terabytes of data and then have them sit and age on your hard disks maybe missing that there's another important update to the data or something like this, right? So the data comes on demand and only the data you need, not in terms of terabytes of data, but just what you need. The data is also well curated, at least, you know, if you if you trust in, in S3, and again, they are, they are um, leading the geo-enrichment service uh, ecosystem, so to speak, then you know that the data you're using is already curated, has already been looked at, so it comes with certain quality assurances, right? The data is also pre-apportioned, which as I said before, it's custom tailored just to your area of study. And finally, it's ready for usage in a geographic information system, so you're not getting it in some format that you then have to process, you're getting it immediately into your geographic information system, and maybe in the future in, in another system of your choice. So what about the downsides? Well, unfortunately, there are plenty. This only works for a small set of predefined categories, like for instance, for demographic data right now. You're also essentially locking yourself into yet another data silo. You can't say, well, enrich my own data with all the great information out there, but take this from this source, this from this source, and here I trust yet another party, please take their data. You can't do this, unfortunately. Also, the data is flat or tabular in the sense that you can't do any follow-up query See, once you have taken your own data, your knowledge about the situation, enriched it on demand, you can't do a query like, oh, that's interesting. Now go on and fetch me more. And finally, no matter how big these companies are, whether these are the Googles, Microsofts, or, or Estris of this world, they can't offer this you know, up to date across all sorts of data repositories because that would be quite a sizable investment. So it needs more like an open community style of approach like we know from Wikipedia or, or Wikidata or something like this. And finally, and that's for, for us here at the Nowhere Graph, the biggest struggle, the geo-enrichment services today don't fix the data integration problem. So yes, you get more data, but stitching the data together, seeing how they fit and making them work together, that's still up to you. Luckily, there's another technology that does exactly this, that excels at the integration part. And these are knowledge graphs. I could spend hours talking about knowledge graph and you will see my colleagues who are also with me in the booth here in the session today and tomorrow talk about knowledge graphs in more detail. But to put it all in a nutshell, knowledge graphs are a relatively new paradigm for knowledge representation, knowledge retrieval and knowledge integration that focuses more on relationships over a purely attribute-based view. So instead of focusing purely on, for instance, the Thomas fire that I mentioned before, being named the Thomas fire, having burned from this date to this date, or spanning this entire burned area, knowledge graphs allow you to really quickly connect information together across themes and domains. For instance, a typical knowledge graph statement would be, the Thomas fire burned in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County. Ventura County and Santa Barbara County are adjacent counties. The Thomas fire also caused a um, mudslide, namely when, the, when it burned through the, the, you know, the back hills in Santa Barbara County, and then it happened relatively late in the season. The first storm came, the soil couldn't anymore hold the water, 
And then we got all the mud and gravel slide down our community, which killed 20. So what I just said, I relate to people, places, timeline, two different types of events and stuff like this. This is what knowledge graphs really excel at. Also, and very importantly, knowledge graphs are about collecting individual data items, not data sets. So you may be used to web portals like this data one stops, so to speak. And by the way, ask yourself why we need another data one stop every five years. Obviously, something isn't, isn't solved there yet, right? Knowledge graphs don't serve your data sets. You don't type keyword search and then you download the data set. They really serve and connect individual data like one individual fire with one particular county with one particular, for instance, disease or something like this. And they do this across data themes and data sites. What they also do and what is unique to this technology, they break up what's called the data metadata distinction, namely that you have the data and then you have data about that data set or the data items, namely the metadata. And of course, metadata creation and curation is a problem, but also understanding what kind of metadata will satisfy the needs of future users. And future users, this opportunistic reuse of data, as you may know, is one of the biggest drivers of the data science revolution. So knowledge graphs conquer this problem by making every data item, every observation, so to speak, describe itself using a machine readable and machine reasonable form, namely by giving it what we call the rich semantics. So they have their own definition, what we call a, a schema or an ontology so that every data item describes what it does and how to use it. So here you have one example of a little bit the work that we are doing, namely we, the Noah Graph Project, we are the first to bring together this idea of the geo-enrichment, but now suddenly with this open-ended, pre-integrated knowledge graph structure. So you get the benefits of geo-enrichment, but we also bring you solutions to many of the shortcomings of geo-enrichment discussed before. And um, I sent out the graph here quite a bit, so there's of course way more to see. I will talk about this later, just to give you a first impression of what you can do and how to use the nowhere graph, for instance, for environmental intelligence applications. Here, for instance, we are looking at a hurricane, and this hurricane, and that's the, the what part in the center of your screen, hit a specific region, namely orange in Texas. And now you may want to know more about orange. So you would go to the where part to the right hand side of the graph and learn not only more about orange in terms of where is orange, which counties are adjacent to orange, what kind of population is there in orange, what kind of transportation infrastructure is there, what about demographic properties of the population like people with obesity or people who are older and maybe having a harder time to evacuate. But you also learn about all the previous events that happened in Orange, not only hurricanes, but floods, storms, fires, whatever, right? And then you can further explore that. But you may also ask yourself a question like, was there something specific about Orange, right? After all, you picked Orange for a reason. So you're going to the how part of the graph here, and you are going to explore the entire storm episode. So not only the impact of the hurricane at Orange, but over the entire geographic region. And then you will be able directly in our graph to explore all the neighboring places or counties and ask yourself questions, or in fact, ask the graph questions like, was Orange affected more, for instance, when it comes to loss to life, or because a lot of our applications are about food supply, were there more effects to, to crop, for instance, and what's the reason for this? Or you can do something that, um, that is quite easy to do in a knowledge graph, but would be quite difficult to do in, for instance, a classical database. You can walk over to the lower left and say, well, there's not only hurricanes, the phenomenon in the real physical world, there's also hurricanes, the research topic or the topic that we as humans can know about. And please find me people in this area or maybe in another area that understand hurricanes and the impact and that have worked, for instance, for relief organizations or in science about these topics. So you can also pick from many tens of thousands from people in our graph. So before I move on and talk a little bit more about our pilots, I wanted to give a shout out to two other groups, the Spoke Graph and the U of OKN that we are both working with. And they also have their booth here at the Expo, so you can go check them out. And the reason why I'm doing this is because one graph like ours is certainly very exciting because we are layering on top 
billions and billions of interesting statements about the world from more than 30 different data layers. But the real party, so to speak, really starts when you start connecting knowledge graphs to what we call an open knowledge network. So essentially an ecosystem of knowledge graphs. And this has been done before. So we think we know how to do this. And as a first seed, so to speak, we are just starting to work with those two graphs, Spoke and UFO and to connect our graphs so that whenever you ask about information from our graph, you can also ask about medical expertise. You can ask about illnesses, pathogens and stuff like this, or UFO can they're for instance, experts in very high resolution data about floods. Again, go check them out. Why are we doing this? Well, because we're increasing the coverage, not only horizontally, so we have more knowledge to know about any certain place, but of course, also this way vertically across many domains. So who benefits from all this? So we have a couple of pilots and prototypes that we keep growing. The four that I'm mentioning here um, are pilots that are darker blue if they are well advanced or at least you know we have prototypes there and ideas how to do this or maybe we are already rolling them out and then the lighter blue one is one that we are just about to start and then there's a yellow one that i can't fully talk about in environmental intelligence applications but that's an exciting one that hopefully the next expo, expo i will be able to tell you more about so for instance we are helping the food industry association to jointly enhance the sustainability, efficiency, and safety of consumer food supplies. What we are also doing with farm credit associations, we are exploring jointly how to use the knowledge graph in understanding land valuation and the risk of default, for instance, giving climate drivers and the increasing, for instance, risk of fires during growing season and so on. With humanitarian aid organization Direct Relief, we are, for instance, working on not only improving their supply chains and identifying which goods they need to deliver in what kind of crisis, but we are also rapidly helping them to match their needs with experts on the ground. I will talk about this a little bit later. And then, as I said, the, the, the pale blue one is one that we are very excited about that's going to be together with partners to study, for instance, how to mitigate risks from earthquakes where we could be, the nowhere graph could be a data layer to understand the population at risk and the areas at risk, both in times of crisis and in crisis simulation. So back to this direct relief example, without going into too much detail, you will learn about direct relief and their work and how they use the graph in one of the follow-up sessions. So please join Anna, Andrew and, and Mark and Ben Ben in this session. Um, Questions, for instance, that people at Direct Relief have to, have to deal with go like this. For instance, last year, maybe it was the year before, we had two hurricanes move side by side with only, I believe, six weeks difference into essentially the same area of Louisiana and Texas. So what Direct Relief needed to know is what's the path of the hurricane? What kind of previous events have there been? For instance, the previous hurricane, because keep in mind, people are still distributed. They haven't yet still returned home, either because they can't or they don't feel safe. What is the COVID situation? Keep in mind, this was peak COVID going to be X days from now because people didn't want to shelter in large shelters during COVID. So that was an additional challenge. And who know more about these people so that the population at risk, the events, the regions, the COVID forecast and so forth. And without the knowledge graph, each of these tasks, gaining information about all previous events, which areas have been affected, what happened there, the types of damage, what was specific about these areas, who are the people to talk to, is the transportation area impacted by the first hurricane? That would be a long, you know, full day task, so to speak, for an expert at direct relief. Same with COVID forecast. You may know that there are more than 50 COVID forecasts. At this time, there were more than 50 in the United States, and none of them worked perfect for the entire country. So they were very good in some regions, but not so good in others. So you had to be smart about selecting them. And of course, if you would like to find experts, either they're already in your network, where then you are lucky, or you need to reach out to other relief organizations and grow your network, but that takes time. And with NOAA graph, we aim at really breaking this down from a task of hours or at least many, many minutes to something like seconds or just a couple of minutes. And we have been able to demonstrate in several application examples that we actually able to do so. So what exactly is it that we serve in this graph and how do we do this? 
OAGRAPH 101 session for you, I believe, directly after the session. So please join this one if you would like to really see a tutorial and see how this all works together. So I'm going to give you like, you know, the, the flyby version here. Uh, essentially, nowhere graph data can be split into two different parts here. The one part is all sorts of geographic identifiers, and the other part is all the information about identifiers. So for instance, we have all global administrative areas in the US and globally. We have national weather zones. We have FIPS code, Nielsen market areas, zip division, gazetteer place names, whether it's from cities or, or mountain ranges or you don't care about any of those named geographic regions, like whether it's a, you know, a climate area or a FIPS code or something like this. I'm just going getting the news that my connection is a little bit unstable. If uh, the audio is breaking up. Um, so, in those cases where none of these predefined, millions of predefined geographic regions matches your needs, we also read hierarchical global grid, namely the S2 grid, at various spatial resolutions for you, which means that you can almost click together, like, you know, like in a, in a drawing program or a map the areas at fine spatial resolution down to a square kilometer that you care about, like draw a, a polygon around custom tailored directly for the graph, just about this area of interest. So this is the geographic part. What do you get? Well, you get multiple data layers ranging from factors, transportation infrastructure, predictions about climate, predictions about, for instance, the, the, the smoke plumes from fires, Roughly speaking, and I will talk about this in a second, 12.5 to 15 billion different statements, we call them triplets, about all those areas of interest. But you're not only getting those billions and billions of facts of us, you're also getting our connections to, to knowledge hubs like Wikidata and Wikipedia, and in the future also to those folks at Spoke and UFOK. What is roughly speaking our graph? Again, more during this knowledge graph, nowhere graph 101 session following uh, my presentation here. But roughly speaking, and depending on how 15 billion graph statements, we call those triplets in our graph that span roughly speaking 30 different data sources. This changes frequently because we are growing very quickly. About um, 12 organizations that include government data, data from you know, climate predictions, data from NGOs and stuff like this. Once we are done, we are going to have probably four to five times that much in the coming months. And um, adding data here, you see one example, for instance, this is data about Santa Barbara, as you can see in the smaller bubble in the middle. And these are just the flood event, hail event, uh, and so forth like data. And there's, of course, way, way more, just very hard to visualize because, again, it's billion of statements about every single event, the damage from the event, how the events relate. So you can check under the IRI there, the nowhere graph org slash graph, what's current in the graph. This will always be outdated, so I apologize. We are just fast and growing. The but you can see that we have soil properties, and like soil tarps, farmland, uh, so the current data for this. We have every single wildfire in the United States, 180,000, I believe, since 84. We have all the earthquakes above magnitude 4.5. We have all climate hazards since the 50s. We have COVID experts. We have general experts and cropland series. We have every single land uh, air quality observation since the 80s. We have smoke plume and smoke plume simulation, disaster declarations. Um, transportation network, public health data like poverty, obesity, diabetes, and stuff like this, social indicators, um, critical infrastructure like hospital, hurricane tracks, and the list goes on and on. And of course, then you have those geographic identifiers to match those. I would like to also have a session that we are going to run, namely, how does this work internally, not so much from the machine learning or, or graph creation and enrichment side, but also from the series that are essentially mathematical series described in a certain knowledge representation language called description logics that help us not only describe what is there, but also help new fact 
facts from what we know is already there. And my, my colleagues, Gordon Schiemes and Pascal Hitzler, are going to lead the presentation and reasoning part of the equation. So before we finish, maybe you think, well, that's all spectacular, but this reminds me a lot of the data portals that we have. So let me give you one example why this approach is radically different from data portals, not only in terms of the AI readiness and in terms of the cross-layer linkage and the, the, in the access to, to data, but let me point you at one specific problem. So for instance, this is the, the GIS portal from Harris County. And if you are responsible for this data portal, this is no complaint, this is just an observation. So many of these data portals, whether it's from Harris or, or another county, or maybe a city like Houston, they have these themes that you see there at the areas, health, security, parks, recreation, transportation. And then for instance, you click on one and then you get what you see next. You can get access here from the Houston portal now, access to a data on, on, for instance, flood risk. And I got exactly one data set here about flood risk, but notice the irony for flood hazards. I got the data set about zones. So keep in mind, I'm not really getting anything that tells me about floods. I'm not getting any previous floods. I'm going to get a file to download and then process of my own about other floods in, 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 in Houston County, which are uh, Houston cities, which I, and assume you agree with me, it's not the most valuable thing here. But the reason I, I picked was also to show you how they are structured. They're always structured around one specific division of geographic space. Sorry to hear this, maybe it's better now. Okay, anyway, where was I? Those, the natural phenomena that we are studying, they don't stop at the borders of our, in our representation, this is all integrated based on the actual events and the geographic identifiers is the way you can, for instance, search the data or be informed about because you're in the wrong uh, portal. So here's, for instance, one of the screenshots from the way we approach this problem. And you're going to learn about this both in the one-on-one -on -one session and in our, for instance, this is the blue box at the top. We are tracking a certain hurricane and now we can get immediate information about all the counties that are affected. That's why I'm using the Texas and Harris example here. The population damage from the flash floods, from the hurricanes, from the, from the storm surges and stuff like this. And at the same time, for instance, relate this, that's what you see on the left to diabetes rates and so on and so forth. So what's the difference in a nutshell that we make? Well, what we serve is every single individual data record in a searchable link and AI ready form not some link to a data set. Um, we also provide data for every type of region that may be of interest to you, either predefined region or using those as two sets. You don't have to rely on individual portals for predefined regions, so to speak. We also don't make you download data, then overlay the data and directly ask questions to the graph like which county was most affected by which hurricane how does this relate to population characteristics in that county and stuff like that and on well-approved standardized and open international standards and speak of a specific technology our products will not go the way of all these previous portals when flash went away or maybe when silver light is being phased out because we are based again on not some closed technology stack, but on an open, well-standardized um, technology paradigm. Here is our team in terms of partners. And um, this is who we are. I'm sorry for, for the audio or video issues. We tested it before and it worked well. And, and now we have um, 45 minutes for Q&A. Let me maybe start with something that is worth noting. And that is that the way we serve all this data is through, you can either programmatically, if you like the typical data scientist access this via an API or a query endpoint. So all of our data is freely available via, I call this a Sparkle endpoint, which is a, a graph query language. But you can also use our, our faceted search interface, which is a simple means of already there or you can use some of our more bespoke visualization solutions like the one that I just showed you for the, for the storm trajectory and the next sessions, how to do this. Oh, fantastic, fantastic questions there about the, um, the scalability. So um, 
depends on how you look at the problem. Our graph currently has roughly speaking in the order of, you know, 10 to 20 billion graph. Regarding, yeah, regarding the scalability issues, that's a very good question, actually. So far, our graph have over 12 billion statements. So it includes about like 600 classes and thousands of instances. And um, uh, regarding scalability, we tested it on, you know, either non-spatial query and spatial queries. So for non-spatial queries, actually, the scalability uh, is quite good. So we can have a, a very complex uh, Sparkle query there, and it can return results uh, in seconds. Uh, however, for spatial queries, it depends. So if the spatial query is complex, um, you know, using the spatial operations such as you using nearby bufferings and so on, these kind of complex spatial uh, uh, operations, it's, it, it is slow. Uh, but if it is using uh, simple spatial operations, then it is fast. Uh, we do have some solutions to address these scalability issues. Uh, for example, we are actually trying to materialize all those different spatial relations in our graph so that while well, you the query our graph, it can directly query it uh, from our indexed database. Um, so that's our current solutions. Uh, and we also plan to do more experiment on this um, scalability issues in the future. Yeah, Yano, I see you are back. Uh, feel free to add things to my answer to this. No, I think the answer was perfect. Sorry for the hiccup. I changed networks and I hope it's better now. Just oh, another question in the chat. Very interesting um, question in the chat. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting question. What about what about questions that, may, that you may have, but that need some sort of additional computation, for instance, aggregation or something like this, or, or uh, processing of densities or certainties or something like this? Yes. So the typical application here would be that you use our information or our graph as the data provider. You ask the queries that you would like, and then you would be doing those compute operations yourself. You can also do some of these simpler compute operations directly on the level of the query language, but that may be rather costly. So what we do for this, for instance, and, and, and my colleague Corby Fisher will talk later about this for the specific application areas, is that you then have something like an, a JavaScript framework on top of this or something like this. Or of course, by the way, you can also read in our data into something like like R or MATLAB or whatever your analytical environment is. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really great question. Yes, that would be something that that um, would suit a knowledge graph application very very well. And in fact, there are knowledge graphs like ChemSpider, for instance, that do something like this. And we have colleagues at UCSB who work in the area of industrial ecology where they try to do exactly this for every chemical compounds, so to speak, what are all the identifiers that you could use, right? Certificate identifiers, more popular identifiers, and what type of products use or contain this kind of chemical compound. Absolutely. And what we would then do, for instance, is we would have the, the environmental footprint, for instance, or the where you can source this material, for instance. And then somebody like, for instance, uh, Sergio's team, they may have, for instance, the, the knowledge graph I mentioned before, they may have, for instance, health impacts of these chemicals. This is where they would, for instance, start. And I believe they do have this data. So thank you very much. Great question. And maybe I can spend one more minute to talk a little bit about um, an analogy maybe to, to what we are really trying to build there, not just we, but the entire track A and many others. If you look at the, the World Wide Web as envisioned by and then implemented by, by Tim Berners-Lee that you're also familiar with, navigating from web page to web page. What we are essentially doing in the knowledge graph community and what we call this open knowledge network for many different graphs and data sources is to take this idea of the World Wide Web as a web of documents and turn it in a web of data so that each individual data item is connected and you can really navigate from a specific event like an earthquake or a hurricane to the affected population, to uh, political information about this, to news articles about this area, to events that happened there previously, to affected transportation networks, and so on and so forth. So therefore, sometimes knowledge graphs also go by the name of linked data, because essentially, they are like the web of documents, but for data. 
Oh, fantastic question. Thank you so much. I, I, I was uh, essentially uh, hoping for somebody to ask this. It's very much related to Web3, absolutely. So the question for those of you not reading the chat is, how does this relate to Web3? This is in fact the, the vision of the Web3. The problem is that the Web3 term now has two different interpretations. One is the interpretation that we are talking about here, the web of documents, so to speak, a distributed web scale infrastructure for question answering directly based on those, um, those information items. And there's a certain second interpretation of what Web3 means, and this largely relates to blockchain technologies. But why they may be thinking, or why it may sound like those two interpretations of Web3 are very different, they're quite similar, in fact, because the, the blockchain part, so to speak, is more of a provenance provider. It's more of providing guarantees that information is true or that information was present or that a certain transaction happened. It's more of a question of how to deliver information in a no trust environment, so to speak. So both of these work very well together. Thank you so much for the question. Yes, fantastic. Are there only specific types of data that are supported? Well, we support a very wide range of data sets, namely, um, well, all of them are environmental in the sense that they're all geolocated somewhere because we are the, or the nowhere graph. But we ingest data that comes from a multitude of formats, field-based data from remote sense missions, comma-separated value files, XML files, right? Um, shapefiles, so sources of geographic data, and, and so on and so forth. So now it works across all sorts of data media because we are then lifting the, the data to a graph, to a common graph data structure. Great question. So no, it works across data formats. That's one of the very exciting things. Fantastic question, Manuel. If there's no other questions, then thank you so much for, for joining our presentation here. Please visit our other sessions. This one was a more of an overview. Those other sessions will be quite hand-on, so you will be learning how to use the graph, what's really in the graph, how we have applied the graph to, to with commercial partners, and I hope you will in, enjoy all of this. Also check out the other Track A teams. Uh, they're all fantastic, and please reach out to us if you would like to be involved, if you would like to be one of the future pilots, if you would like to be a Noel Graph user, and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks again.